Live from downtown Vancouver at the Vancouver Film School campus, it's time for EP Live. Hey, welcome to EPN. My name is Victor Lucas, and we bring you the latest in everything cool, and it is so good to be back. It's been a little bit of a break. I went down to Los Angeles. Uh, I took a look at Borderlands 3, which I can't talk about, but uh, we'll have some information on that and a cool new interview very soon. Um, I had some fun on that trip and saw a lot of uh, familiar faces, and maybe one or two of them will appear on the show next week. Uh, we've got an incredible show lined up for you today. We've got uh, Nick and Danny from Phoenix. Labs in the house to talk to us about Dauntless, which has recently launched on the consoles out there. We're going to play some of that, and we're going to talk about that. Um, I've also got uh, this cool uh, little box of treats that our friends at Tri Chips Ahoy sent out, and I think that this is very cool. It's tied to a, a, a partnership that they have with Gears 5, and they sent me an email and said, we, we've got a little care package we'd like to send your way, um, and it's uh, tied to our relationship with uh, Gears 5, and they said, we've got cookies uh, th for the September 10th launch, like these cookies are going to last until September 10th, uh, <laughs> which is when Gears 5 launches. Um, and they sent us enough cookies that uh, I can share them with the studio audience. There you go. There's, uh, there's uh, cookies for you and cookies for you guys. Good catches. That's awesome. You guys can have some when you come up on stage, okay? Uh, and so that's that's actually kind of new. I've never been able to throw out um, uh, treats to the audience before. That's a good idea. If you've got treats that you want to send us, get in touch with us. That'd be great. Uh, uh, no cars today. I'm not Oprah. Uh, but we, we do have a rundown to dedicate, and this one is going out to our uh, friend VMW Industries, who says the rundowns are the best. You knew you were going to get a rundown saying that. Let's get, let's get started with VMW's Industries Rundown. Now, the world is going to be getting the uh, first details on a new Resident Evil game very soon. Capcom has announced that a mysterious new game in the zombie franchise will begin testing on September 20th in New York and London. Los Angeles. Members of the Resident Evil Ambassador program will be able to test the game at a special event in those cities, so expect the first details to be made available publicly around the same time. Capcom first hinted that a new game was on the way last week, although we still don't know if this uh, is an all-new entry like Resident Evil 8, a remake of an existing title like the recent Resident Evil 2, or even the upcoming Switch ports of older games. Expect more details soon. Um, considering how well that Capcom did with Resident Evil 2, I wouldn't be surprised if they've got a whole bunch of new plans for remakes and reboots of their classic franchises. It does feel like those games were amazing in their day, but they were even because I've been doing this for a damn long time. I remember reviewing those games and feeling like these are a little bit clunky back then. So they do feel like they are ripe for reinvention and uh, to to, to kind of reestablish what Resident Evil means going forward, because you and I know they took some missteps along the way, so it's almost like, let's go back, let's fix some of the problems that we had, and we'll do this again right. So for a whole new generation of, of uh, players out there, these are going to be the you know new versions of Resident Evil. Um, so I would be okay with that, although... Part of me says, look, let's get into some new things. I love what they did with Resident Evil 7. I thought that uh, that was a terrifying VR experience, and uh, I wouldn't mind for them to be experimenting with something brand new, especially if it's tied to the next consoles. That would be pretty rad as well, and maybe the next iterations of whatever VR and AR may be uh, you know, tethered, hopefully not tethered, Hopefully tethered is the operative word. They are not tethered because that would be much better for those systems. But uh, it would be pretty cool to experience that terror uh, in first person like we did with Resident Evil 7. Although Resident Evil 2 made a lot of people very, very happy. Uh, we'd love to hear what you guys think. Let us know in the comments below or in the chat today. Um, what do you want Capcom to make in the Resident Evil universe? Something old, new again, or something totally brand new? Uh, now, Disney is using Marvel to help push their new streaming service, Disney+, Plus, but they're not the only studio with the same idea. Sony and Into the Spider-Verse producers Phil Lord and Chris Miller are developing an entire universe of live-action and animated Spider-Man TV shows. The project was first announced earlier this year, and uh, now speaking with Deadline, Lord and Miller says that the new shows will be a mix of both live-action and animation. The plan is to have each show focus on a different character while all taking place within the same shared universe. They'll 
only be able to use Spider-Man characters because they're the only ones owned by Sony. So don't expect to see other Marvel heroes pop in. No word yet on when the first batch of shows might hit the airwaves. I'm excited as hell for this, and I think that this partnership with uh, Phil Lord and Chris Miller is a genius move on Sony's part. Into the Spider-Verse is uh, arguably the best superhero movie that has been made so far and every time i watch it i am uh, moved by it in different ways i just think it's an extraordinary accomplishment um and i i think that these creators are uh uh they're wonderful contribute contributors to popular culture you know they have a real they have their finger on something there they really understand how to make something uh resonate in a bunch of different ways comedically uh emotionally um you know cross-culturally I am very excited about this, and I also believe that the Spider-Man universe is rich with lots of different ways to interpret uh, and lots of different uh, uh, characters to flesh out, uh, flesh out and to kind of bring up to the fore. I, and you know what they are doing with this whole enterprise. Sony it has basically been given a long plank to walk until their inevitable misstep, like what Fox did with the X-Men movies, and then Disney will be able to pull it all right back again, you know, or they'll buy it back at a, at a wholesale price uh, and, and sort of wrap it all underneath the umbrella of uh, Marvel. Or Sony will be a contributor to whatever the MCU is putting out there and uh, help to bolster their, um, their coffers without having, you know, Disney to spend all of that money and all that stuff because Disney still takes a huge chunk of all the action figures that they sell and all the – all of the licensing that that uh, you know comes along with each one of these things being a hit. We saw that uh, Venom was a massive success. We know that uh, um, Andy Serkis is directing the next Venom film. I think that this is uh, this bodes well, you know. And I love what Sony's been doing with the recent Spider-Man movies. So, yes, they're partnered with Marvel. Uh, I think that this is going to work out just fine, and I am excited. All right, the last season of Game of Thrones was a little controversial, but that hasn't dethroned the show's creators. Game of Thrones showrunners David Benioff and D.B. Weiss have inked a deal to develop new films and TV shows with HBO rival Netflix. The pair has been uh, have been uh, courted. Uh, the pair have been courting different networks and streaming companies ever since Game of Thrones ended, and there are reports that Netflix paid as much as 200 million bucks to win them over. The pair have been in high demand despite the mixed reception of the final Game of Thrones season because every network wants their own Game of Thrones caliber hit. Along with the uh, Netflix deal, Benioff and Weiss are also developing new Star Wars movies for Disney, the first of which lands in 2022. Uh, I think that this might be a little bit of a risky play, but what else is Netflix going to do but, you know, take some risky plays? They have to own as much of this content as possible. They've been partnered with every studio in Hollywood for a long time, and of course every studio in Hollywood is trying to launch their own streaming service right now, so they're all going to be very, very strong competitors, especially Disney, to whatever Netflix is putting out there. And so the only thing that Netflix has got up their sleeve is the ability to use their already established uh, install base of subscribers and spend money on uh, buying their own content. And they've got to try um, things that feel like bets, but, you know, a, a few years ago, this was a sure bet. So you never know. You know, we never knew how big Game of Thrones was going to be. HBO didn't know. Um, and I think, it, you know, it's exceeded all expectations out there. And lots of people were pissed off with that final season. I wasn't. It's dismaying to, to read the uh, uh, amount of backlash that uh, even actors that were in the show have been sort of uh, propagating on the Internet recently about how, how, how much the last uh, episodes disappointed them. I totally get it if, it, if they disappointed you. But in, in total... I was uh, very entertained and very happy with Game of Thrones. But, yeah, these guys, um, I, I feel like they've got a little bit of a target on their back, and it doesn't help that they now have uh, 200 million bucks sort of riding over their heads, you know? Like, everybody's looking like, Sh prove it. Show us what you got. Let's see what you got for us. Uh, but hopefully this, this works out and they come up with something uh, extraordinary. You know, maybe lightning will strike twice and we'll get another Game of Thrones caliber of sensation, which would be rad. All right, the three big console makers are joining forces to take on loot boxes. Microsoft and Nintendo have announced, uh, and Sony have announced new policies designed to enforce how loot boxes are sold on their platforms. 
Uh, going forward, all games will be required to disclose the rarity of loot box items, which will make transactions a lot more transparent. The announcement was made earlier this week during a panel hosted by the U.S. government's Federal Trade Commission, or FTC. So although the new policy is voluntary, it could be the console maker's way to prevent the government from making even more stringent regulations down the road. Looking ahead, Rocket League developer Psyonix has announced that they're going one step further and getting rid of randomized loot boxes altogether and will instead allow players to purchase specific items for a flat fee. It feels like the industry is making a giant move in this direction. I think loot boxes don't have much longer uh, in the video game's uh, reality. I think that they are going to be... Uh, they're going to be cut out. And it's going to mean a lot of uh, companies are going to take a financial hit because these things have been ex extraordinarily successful. I think if you point at uh, you know, the FIFA franchise or some of the other sports games out there, you can kind of uh, compare it and contrast it with uh, uh, you know, the, the playing cards that have been a part of sports you know, fandom forever. People would go in and buy a, a pack of cards with bubble gum and, you know, do lots of trades and stuff if they had doubles. There's there's an, an analogy there. There's a direct kind of parody there. Uh, but with lots of other items out there and lots of other games out there, it just doesn't make as much sense. And there's a lot of unhappy people. And I think that's the core of it, is that there's enough of an unhappy audience out there that the games industry itself needs to kind of turn that, that frown upside down. You know, they've got to change the perspective and not make this a story, you know, uh, especially in the light of the, uh, the ridiculous, uh, you know, calls to games being so violent that they're encouraging people to be uh, mass shooters out there, sort of be a, a downer on all that stuff. But that's just absolutely ludicrous. Uh, but let's not give the, uh, the naysayers and the doubters and the, uh, the people that have no understanding of the value and, and the cultural relevance of video games any more power to say that these things are bad for people, you know? And I think one of the ways that we can do that is we can take loot boxes out of the equation and uh, uh, remove any kind of specter of gambling associated with video games entirely. And I think the games industry really needs to do that. It's a big topic, and it's something that the entire industry is talking about. And, uh, uh, you know, I think that there's some big moves ahead. All right, you guys, that is uh, going to do it for our rundown. Let's take a look back at this day and everything cool. Welcome to this day and everything cool for August 9th. On this day in 2016, one of the biggest and most controversial games ever made hit Earth for the first time. The outer space exploration game No Man's Sky hit the PS4 with a PC release following a few days later. Developer Hello Games had already made a name for themselves with the popular Joe Danger series, but with No Man's Sky, they wanted to try something different and much more ambitious. The game used procedural generation to randomly create planets, stars, and an entire universe, with players having literally trillions upon trillions of different worlds to explore. How you explored them was also pretty cool, with players able to walk around on the surface, get in a ship, break through the atmosphere, and fly to another planet all without stopping to load. From a technical standpoint, No Man's Sky was a massive achievement. The only problem was there just wasn't really that much to actually do. It didn't take long for most players to start complaining about a lack of compelling content within the game, with many even accusing Hello Games of overselling it and making promises they couldn't deliver. Sony president Shuhei Yoshida even voiced his concerns, saying that Hello had a poor strategy when they were promoting the game. Because of all the criticism, the team at Hello Games worked hard to fill their universe with new content, releasing a series of free expansions like the Foundation Update and Atlas Rises, which slowly started to win back players. Almost exactly two years later, they released a completely revamped version of the game called No Man's Sky Next, and it was met with a much more positive reception. Okay. <laughs> So isn't that amazing? No Man's Sky was our This Day and Everything Cool. And, of course, the Big Beyond update is, like, next week. And those guys yep. have been, uh, I think, Nick and Danny can uh, sympathize a little bit with Hello Games with uh, the continuous development because that's what Dauntless has been all about, right? Yeah, yeah we've been, uh, we launched on uh, Xbox One, PlayStation 4, and PC, or Epic Game Store a couple months back in May. But prior to that, we were in open beta for over a year and, you know, prior to that, closed beta for a little bit, too. So, yeah. Awesome. But uh, recently, you guys launched on the PlayStation 4 and the Xbox One. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank Congratulations, you. Danny. Thank you. Danny is going to play the game for us, and we're going to get into a little bit. Uh, is it, it, It's like 
further on into one of the expansions, right? Yeah, so a yeah. um, couple weeks back, we launched uh, one of our latest seasons, which mm -hmm. came with it a brand new game mode called The Island of Trials. Okay. Um, pretty challenging content geared at um, some of our most hardcore players, but uh, comes complete with its own rewards and a leaderboard, as you can see here. And uh, Danny and Co are going to see if they can get on the leaderboard. Awesome! Top the leaderboard. If just survive. If, just Dan survive? if Danny survives, okay. does he win pants? Or no, no, no pants. No That's pants for Danny. <laughs> 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 That's a choice, Danny. Right? Yeah. It's summer. Why would you wear pants? Yeah. Right? You fight better without your pants. You fight better without <laughs> pants. Okay, you heard it here first. Uh, okay, for those that don't know what Dauntless is, and we had you guys on before, and I was, you know, a little bit into it at that point. Like, I'd, I'd started to understand a little bit of it. Uh, but I know that lots and lots of people out there don't know tons, and you've got brand new, uh, you know, opportunities to reach people on the uh, consoles. Yeah. Take us into what Dauntless is. Sure, yeah. So, uh, Dauntless is an online co-op action RPG. Mm -hmm. um, um, it's, um, as you mentioned, it's out on Xbox One, PlayStation 4, and Epic Game Store. Yep. Features full cross-play, so you can play with your friends regardless of platform. And really at its core, it's about players coming, to ga coming together, uh, taking up the mantle of a slayer, which you can see here, um, and battling these larger-than-life uh, boss-sized behemoths. So um, combat in the game is very strategic, very coordinated between the players, split second dodges, really high fidelity attacks. And, um, you know, the battles are a little bit longer in nature too, like anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes. Yep. Um, we really wanted to capture a lot of that, uh, kind of that water cooler moment when, you know, you and your friends take down the big bad for the first time. Mm -hmm. um, kind of, you know, hearkening back to days of vanilla World of Warcraft and, you know, world first, raid first, guild first type moments. I guess every one of the monsters that you go and chase is a little bit like a raid in a way, right? Yeah, you know, yeah. different phases, different attacks. They can get enraged. They can enter what we call Aether State, which is like even more amped up. They'll flee. Um, different personalities based on how the fight's progressing. That's awesome. How has the game been doing for you guys? You launched about a year ago. Yep. And, you know, you've had lots of time to kind of furnish the, uh, the community out there, and you guys came from big games like League of Legends and Mass Effect and lots of other ones out there, but how has Dauntless been received? Um, it's honestly, it's been amazing. Like, we've been completely floored, and uh, we couldn't be happier. The community's been incredibly supportive um, since day one, even, you know, prior to, to console launch. Um, and really, it, it's been a collaborative effort between us and the community every step of the way. You yeah. know, um, early on in, in the first days, um, started the dialogue with the community, and they've helped us every step of the way with feedback and bug reports and suggestions. And really, um, the Dauntless that you play today is, is the end result of that collaboration. You guys learned a lot about free-to-play, uh, obviously working with Riot and you decided early on that that was going to be the model for Dauntless. How, how much has the free-to-play kind of environment changed since you decided that you were going to go in this direction? We, yeah. We were talking a little bit in the news today, but also before we started rolling about you guys had a loot box idea for a while, but you took that out. Yeah, we, um, you know, early on coming from, uh, several of us worked at, at Riot Games, which um, puts out League of Legends, which is an awesome game. and. Um, Early on, we really believed in the free-to-play model because it, we felt it, it helped a lot with accessibility. Mm -hmm. You know, no longer do you need to save up $60 to buy a game on a shelf. You can just download it and play it um, for free. And with that, we brought with um, a lot of our ideas um, from working at League of Legends around cosmetics, right? Like, the last thing we wanted to do is make the game free-to-play and then throw up a paywall. So, like, $5 to fight this behemoth or $10 to use this weapon. Right. So, the core game loop, all the behemoths, the trials mode we're looking at, all of this is, is free-to-play. Um, so, a lot of our, cosme or a lot of our um, uh, uh, transactions and a lot of our offerings are based around um, player expression, player personalization. Um, Danny's wearing one of, I think this is from Dark Harvest last year, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. when you have a new season or a new event, there's new outfits and new customization options every time. Yeah, we, uh, uh, towards the end of last year, rolled out what we call our first Hunt Pass. Mm -hmm. uh, we've, we're on Hunt Pass Season 6 now. And um, basically every month or so, players can expect a whole new season to sweep through Dauntless. Um, comes complete with 
uh, new reward track um, to level up through new cosmetic items in the store, which you can earn or purchase. Um, new, like you can see in the city here, has got a bit of a takeover to celebrate the current season, like the banners and the flags hanging. Um, sometimes it's seasonal, like Dark Harvest for Halloween and Frostfall for the holidays. Um, other times it's something completely agnostic, like Ninjas, which was season five, or Pirates, which is the current season that we're in. Awesome. Let's jump into a battle. Can we go and chase somebody and sure. yeah, get into some, some combat here? Now, Nick, you came from, Bio you worked at Bioware as well, mm -hmm. and you worked at Riot, and those are completely different business models and different companies. Although there's a lot of learnings going on and it's all getting very threaded and, and different yeah. and sort of mixed at this point. But explain to people out there and myself, uh, you know, what, how it's different to go to work every day to work on a game like Dauntless as opposed to working on, were you working on Mass Effect? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I worked on uh, the Mass Effect trilogy with several of the folks at Phoenix Labs. Awesome. And, um, you know, really cherish the time that uh, we had at EA and in working on the Mass Effect trilogy, but, you know, kind of transitioning away from, you know, what we call that boxed product mentality. I think we're seeing, you know, even with like games like Anthem, where the box is just kind of the first step and then there's expansions and patches that come after it. Yep. Um, you know, a game like Dauntless, we want to be living and breathing for months and years to come. So it doesn't matter if, you know, you play Dauntless every day, every week, or, you know, maybe you come back every couple of months and play with your friends on the weekend. There's always something new to check out. So um, as a result, we do create a lot of content. You know, like there's there's kind of like a, a steady state where we're just iterating, developing, patching, implementing, you know, producing, just kind of rinse, repeat, and yep. going through that cycle. But uh, is, super it, exciting. Is the analogy a little bit like, like I've tried to kind of figure it out in my brain, right? Because there's a lot of people like yourself that came from AAA box product kind of development and you you, you send something out and you hope it's going to be a hit. And yeah. if it's a hit, you get to stay together and work on the next one. Uh, but it feels like that is the movie industry mm. and this is the TV industry in a way. Like That's you guys, a good are, analogy. You guys yeah. are constantly working on and hoping, hoping that you're going to work not on a, a thing, but a season. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's it's a really good analogy. And actually, Danny and I were talking on on the drive over here, around you know what we think Dauntless will be in a year or two years or even five years. And um, really, it's it's going to be whatever we as a studio and the community honestly want it to be. Like we can add new game modes or even new genres within the game. I mean, that's the beauty of kind of making a live service is we can learn in real time and within a couple weeks bring a patch to the community to help make the game that much better. Awesome. Are we going to see a giant beast, Danny? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, let's, let's do, do it. it. So right. what we're jumping into here is our new trials mode. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's a new game mode that we added. Um, we saw the leaderboard earlier, there but is. Um, this is one of our behemoths, Embermane. Yep. And um, rather than exploring the world of the Shattered Isles and um, the, I the floating islands that are in it, um, Slayers what dropped. What is that guy doing with <laughs> the shield? What was that? Our rival emotes. <laughs> Hiding behind the log. Yeah, that okay. was uh, <laughs> one of our uh, emotes from season five. Okay. So all right. All right hilarious. now, the the team's um, preparing all their buffs right now, and they're gonna launch into the fight. And um, I'll let Danny speak to this as well if he can play and talk. But um, yeah, Trials Mode features kind of a, a twist on the classic Behemoth fight in which um, not only do you have to fight the Behemoth, but you have to engage with uh, a variety of modifiers as well. So you'll see um, that Lightning Totem that just dropped there as well yep. um, is going to start channeling Lightning Strikes um, that the Slayers are going to have to dodge and manage as well. Are you racing for those pickups before your buddies get to them, or that, does everybody for instance that? Generally, you want to share them all. You want to share, oh, but they, there's only one of them in, the, in that play field. So if, if you're greedy and you run around and collect all of them, you will, probably won't be with that group again. Is that, <laughs> yeah. is that kind of what happens? Yeah. yeah. You want to share all that stuff? Um, but the important thing here is um, at the top, you'll see a timer kind of ticking away. And um, really what the group is um, endeavoring to do is get the lowest time possible because that's how you rank up on the leaderboard. Ah, okay. That's how you earn the rewards exclusive to the trials mode. And is, um, is this a PvP kind of variant? Like you're not competing against each other, but you're competing against other teams. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. yeah, it's a great way to describe it. You know, um, Dauntless is, from day one, we've wanted it to be this um, 
collaborative, cooperative experience. So it's not like me and Danny or you know two slayers fighting each other. But yep. um, given that we're a skill-based game, we're a challenging game. We wanted to incorporate elements of recognition and competition inside of it. So the leaderboard is kind of the first step towards that. That's awesome. Um, when I look at this game, it's hard for me not to think of Monster Hunter. And mm -hmm. was that an inspiration that, that you guys kind of acknowledge out there? Yeah, I mean, it's anytime um, we get compared to Monster Hunter, it's super flattering. Cause it's you know, a great game. A lot of us back at the studio play it. Yeah. And um, early on when we were um, evaluating kind of different genres and different ideas for what our first game would be, um, we had a couple different ideas, a character-based shooter being one of them. And, Thank God we dodged that bullet because <laughs> um, we have lots of great games in that genre space now. Um, the concept of um, a online um, like raid boss style, Monster Hunter style game, something that was, you know, Monster Hunter from a gameplay space um, gave us a lot of ideas, but we wanted to do one better and incorporate better online elements, better MMO elements, again, kind of like harkening back to those days of... Because they're balancing a lot of single-player stuff in there. It's exactly. a lot of game that they are really focusing to get that $60 out of people, right? Yeah, and we wanted to incorporate um, more accessibility, again, being free-to-play, more tutorialization, mm -hmm. um, a more what we like to think is a, a, an approachable art style that's a little bit more stylized. Um, a little bit uniquely us. So, um, are you with, going with the model of um, a World of Warcraft or League of Legends, where the story is really about the the characters and how people interpret them, yeah. as opposed to d distinct narrative that sort of fo focuses a line and, and everybody's kind of along for a ride. Yeah, so it's it's a little bit of both. Okay. Um, um, being an online game, you know, player based storytelling, that more emergent storytelling is definitely at the forefront. Mm -hmm. Um, we do have a full, like, if you decide to, you can play the game single player, like, from start to finish. Oh, okay. Um, no need to, you know, like, party up if you don't want to. Mm -hmm. um, comes complete with its own cinematics. You create a character. Hey, you guys survived. Hey, we got you out of silver. <laughs> Bravo. You should, you should try. The, one of the guys that made the game mode. didn't die. Why not? Yeah, yeah that's pretty good. That's, Why not? that's not bad, right? Um, <laughs> so yeah, there, there's cinematics that help kind of set the stage for your character and your story. Lots of quest text, lots of, N lots of NPCs. Um, but we've also found that um, with the introduction of the, the seasonal content, that it gives us a chance to kind of every so often revamp like how players feel the world around them. Sure. Um, so not too long ago, we introduced um, a newer faction called the Ostians. Um, they crashed an airship just right square in the middle of Ramsgate, but brought with them things like new weapons, like grenades and the pistols, which are our first ranged weapon. So um, we may not have the broad sweeping storytelling elements of like a, a traditional Bioware game, but there are elements of story and nooks and crannies. It to sounds a bit like you're making it up too as you're going. It's not, not, not like you're just pulling stuff out of your butt, but you're making it up as you go trying to kind of flesh based on where your the gameplay is leading you a little bit. Yeah, and I think a lot of it, you know, we're talking a lot about community engagement and their involvement as well, but a lot of it has been uh, in, in tandem with the community as well. They right. help tell us what they like and what they want to see more of, and that kind of awesome. helps inform how we flesh out the world as well. Well, you guys gave me a very nice gift today, and this is out in stores right now for uh, Dauntless fans, but it's the art of Dauntless. Yep. And this uh, is a, in partnership with uh, Dark Horse. Yeah, this the wonderful people at Dark Horse helped us put it together. And this will be, it, this is almost like one of the, the classic uh, guidebooks or something, right? <laughs> it, in a way, like it'll, yeah, it'll really teach is... you about the world and the lore and everything. That's cool. Yeah, that's. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's got everything in it from what I guess I would call kind of like our, our open beta um, era of development. Mm -hmm. um, so everything from the early, like the first page is basically the first sketch we made when coming up with the idea for Dauntless and it'll walk you through um, basically the history of how we got to where we're at today. Do you think that this is the future of games? Do you think that more and more people are going to gravitate towards this and maybe it's it sort of dovetails to the subscription model that you know it's going to be about giving players the ability to stay in worlds as long as possible. Yeah. I mean, so if you look at Fortnite and League of Legends and things like that, these are some of the biggest titles on Earth and Warframe and, and you guys yeah. are vying for a spot out there. Yeah, it's it's really interesting because I, you know, I, I tend to, to have that belief that um, the more that games push towards 
um, free to play and service based. All it does is just open up the accessibility for people. Right. Um, no longer do you have to, you know, make sure that you played Fortnite when it came out. Like playing Fortnite of, I think they're on season ten now. Um, completely different than the Fortnite of a couple seasons ago. Yes. But at the same time, um, we're also seeing really amazing AAA blockbuster games come out. Like, I mean, Gears of War Five. I'm personally super excited for. Yes. Um, really looking forward to that. Um, Borderlands Three is also another great one. Yep. And um, we need it all. We yeah, we need. I think it's kind of and you know I'm at home right now playing Bloodstained, which I kickstarted many many years ago. And it's and a great know, game. It's you, a great game. You know what? I, I, and it, it is like movies and TV shows. Yeah. Right. You can go back to your Fortnite TV show. Or you can sit down and, and play through the campaign of Gears, and it's like a movie. Yeah, yeah, which is which isn't bad. You heard yeah. it here first, folks. Yeah, <laughs> that, that idea call right on the there. shot. Yeah, um, and you also gave me this giant mouse pad, so yeah. I have to get a huge mouse. <laughs> but I, I love it, man. That's very cool. It's also like a flag right there. Yeah. How has the game changed? Okay. How has the game changed? Can you see me? Can't even see me behind this giant mouse pad. <laughs> How has the game changed since you launched it on console? Oh man, well, you know, we're still a couple months in on consoles, so mm -hmm. we're still doing a lot of learning and a lot of data collection and really understanding. Um, you know, I mean, we, we shared some numbers um, a little bit ago, but, you know, coming into console. What were those numbers? We had about 3 million players in our PC open beta. Yep. Um, last we checked, we were over 13 million. On console? Uh, with right. console all, and all PC, together. Epic Game Store, all of it all together. We've had Whoa. 13 million people play the game. So, wow. you know, more than triple, quadrupled it. That more than quadrupled it. When you went to console. Yeah. Yeah. So, wow. um, that's, you know, and and fast too, right? Like yeah. it's been, it took us a couple years to get to 3 million players and it took us a couple months to get to the next 10. Wild. Um, so, you know, doing a lot of listening, a lot of understanding of what um, all those new players are doing inside the game and what they, you know, what they're enjoying as well. And we, it's, you, you've got a, a Switch plan mm -hmm. that's happening? Yep. Switch is, um, we're super excited. We, uh, we debuted Switch at E3 this year okay. in the Nintendo booth. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, part of their big reel of all of this content. Yeah, that's yeah. yeah. So we're already hard at work developing the Switch version. Great. Um, we're co-developing with the good people over at Iron Galaxy. Cool. Who have done a couple Switch games as well. Yep. Um, we anticipate it landing this year. And um, if you're coming to PAX and some of the other uh, conventions this year, Hope to see you. We'll be uh, we'll be there as well, and we have some cool surprises in store. Does a free-to-play game like uh, Dauntless also work on something like Stadia? It's a good question. Um, we we've been talking to the folks over at Google um, a lot in the wake of the Stadia announcement. Yep. Um, we know about as much as the rest of the industry does right it's now. It's a big mystery. It's a big mystery. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm super excited to see how it performs. Um, we're super keen to bring Dauntless to as many platforms as we possibly can. Sure, you, of course. Um, that's not to, this is not me announcing we're coming to Stadia anytime soon, yeah. but um, we are super excited to hear more about the platform and the technology. You know, with um, great success comes an inability to create anything else. <laughs> We've seen this with uh, Warframe, and uh, I've talked to developers over there. It's like, we'd really like to make another game, but everybody's yeah. playing Warframe, and I know that the League of Legends folks are probably feeling a little, uh, not trapped, but you know, you you, yeah. you have a lot of people that you need to serve when you get one of these games. Does, yep. does Phoenix Labs want to make other games, or are you happy yep. making this forever? Yeah, we, um, we've talked a lot about being a multi-game studio, and while we haven't made any official announcements around what Game 2 is or Game 3 or anything like that, um, we know that the best time to plant a tree was last week. Okay. So um, Dauntless is absolutely the focus for us right now, but we do understand that if we want another game to drop in a timely fashion in, you know, in the next couple years, call it, that the time to start that game is now. Can so I, can I make you? a suggestion? Yeah. Just as somebody that ha likes the movies and the TV shows, mm -hmm. make some movies. Yeah, I right. Mean, yeah, you know, make some uh, character based, make some uh, games that are based on some of your biggest characters or your coolest creations that are maybe side scrolling, maybe not mega massive epic things, but give us other ways into this world. Yeah, thank you, man. I appreciate that, hearing that's, that. That's that's my suggestion. Yeah, there you. You can take it or leave. <laughs> but Nick and Danny, it has been uh, tr a treat to have you back. Yeah, thank you. Continued thank success you. with Dauntless. That's fantastic, and uh, I'm very glad that lots and lots, millions of new people are playing your game. Yeah. 
Very good. Thank you. Nick and Danny from Phoenix Labs. Thank you, guys. All right, you guys. We uh, have got a review of a series that's taken me a while to get to, but boy, was I glad that I did. Here's my look at The Expanse. My fellow citizens, our faith as a nation has been sorely tested. Many died for us to get here. For this review, I almost feel like I need cue cards because this show, The Expanse, is very complex and it doesn't slow down to let you catch up. Sorry. Amazon runs the show now. They picked it up from Sci-Fi. Season four is coming up later this year and season five has already been greenlit. So there is a lot of Expanse to dig into. We just dodged a massive bullet. It's a science fiction show that takes place hundreds of years in the future and humanity has colonized the solar system, primarily Mars and Earth, and there's conflict between Mars and Earth because humans just can't get along no matter what year we're setting our stories in. And there's also humans scattered throughout different installations on moons and basically across the solar system. But another huge component of this show and of the fiction in the show is there's humans mining an asteroid belt. They call them belters. So what the show kind of sets up is a series loaded with political intrigue and kind of a Cold War dynamic where there is this uneasy truce between Mars and Earth. But in the middle of all of that, we find all of our protagonists. One of them is played by Thomas Jane. He's a detective. Could just follow you around, don't I, kid? Somehow he gets embroiled with the captain of a ship played by Stephen Strait, who has a crew that he's slowly assembling through the first season. As we start to uncover the mystery there, we're also flashing to different factions on Mars and Earth. We're seeing sort of the political infrastructure. The leader of Earth is played by Shore Agdashalu, and you've seen her in lots of shows like 24 and stuff. And She's terrific throughout all of this as well. She's uh, got some funny lines to deliver, and her timing isn't always perfect with the way that she's delivering it, but she's got some sass and some attitude and some, a real strength. And, you know, her gutsiness and her bravado really makes you care about her. Perfect excuse not to quit drinking. <laughs> And that's the thing that I found with this show as it sort of deepens and you start to realize that this mystery that's tipped at in season one is part of a really, really huge conspiracy that's going on. Through season two and through season three, you start to see the scale of that plan that's sort of unfolding and all of these innocent victims that are about to be sucked up into this intrigue. And you feel for all of these different characters. And I think that has a large part to do with the incredible performances here. I don't think stupid. Bam! All of the cast members are great. Thomas Jane has always been a favorite performer of mine. He's always got these interesting quirks and kind of a side-eyed sensibility at the way he approaches his roles, and that's definitely true here with Joe Miller, the detective that he plays. Jared Harris does some fine work. David Strathern is one of my favorite character actors. He's in this. Elizabeth Mitchell, who we saw in Lost and has been in tons of great things. Lots and lots of great things to hang your hat on. You got it. I was trying to think of who my favorite character was, and I tweeted about this. It's, this, it's kind of the sign of a good show when you you can't really figure out who your favorite character or favorite actor is. But I want to single out Wes Chatham as Amos, who is this big burly mechanic, and he is so driven by instinct and trying to do the right thing. He is a massive brute that acts very quickly and kills when necessary. You're kind of scared of him, but you can also see that he's dealing with psychological issues and he's got cracks and he's got loyalties and allegiances and there's some just fine, fine work and some great subtlety. And although this is a weird analogy, I was kind of reminded of Joey in Friends, who everybody wrote off as this really throwaway, silly dunce of a character, and then he became a lot more nuanced as the seasons went on. There's a parallel there with Amos in The Expanse. He's a very, very interesting character and a terrific performance there, but it's very hard to single out anybody. Stephen Strait as the captain is amazing, and I also love all of his colleagues that eventually take over a Martian ship that has combat abilities, and they get chased and hunted by all sides, and they encounter this incredible space marine that joins their crew. I'm telling you, this show has twists and turns and bobs and weaves, and it's like you're watching a giant sci-fi epic every episode, and that can get exhausting. No kidding. Like, you feel like, oh my god, what calamity is going to befall this hapless group of individuals? We're going to find out. But 
it's so well made and there's such an adherence to some really cool fundamental ideas around physics and the way that space really affects the human body and the way that they employ gravity and when we see these spaceships do these crazy turns and stuff you see the effects and people flying around all over the place or they might have to do some repairs on a ship and they've got you know gravity boots that allow them to walk around and you can feel the vulnerability and also humankind's ingenuity to kind of survive in all of these hostile environments we have arrived at the dawn of a new era. It is a truly breathtaking ride that's incredibly intelligent, but it also connects with you emotionally. My favorite sci-fi show of all time is still Battlestar Galactica. And yeah, you can quibble with the episodes here and there or the finale or whatever, but I, I love the the breadth and the, the sort of demographic sweep that was in that show. And the expanse is very close. These human characters have an understanding throughout these episodes that they need each other and they can't just go around slaughtering each other, but they're predisposed to have these biases and they're always on the edge. It's like you're watching this giant meta chess game sort of unfold and you're also getting a lot of really cool micro moments as well. One people with a shared purpose. I definitely recommend you watch The Expanse. We're obligated to check it out. Look forward to season four and season five. I'm going to give what I've seen so far a 9.5 out of 10. All right, you guys, definitely check out The Expanse. It's an amazing show, but uh, that's not all. We have a game review for you. It's, uh, it's called Blazing Chrome. Take a look. A couple of weeks ago, I was all over the Contra Anniversary Collection that Konami put out on the Nintendo Switch. And then, lo and behold, on the Xbox Game Pass, I came across a game called Blazing Chrome, which is an unbelievable homage to the classic Contra games. It definitely looks like a 16-bit version of Contra. It's made with pixels. It's not made with polygons. But it's blisteringly fast, and it's very difficult, and it's got co-op gameplay in there, and it totally harkens back to the glory classic days of playing Contra. You could play as this mohawk little warrior or this robot kind of warrior type. All kinds of crazy enemies that you're going to battle. Some of them look like aliens, some of them look like robots. You've got giant bosses that might look like a giant sandworm or some kind of hovering vehicles with lots of different pieces of armor that you gotta take out. Of course, there's great power-ups as well, like a giant sort of electro ball static whip thing. You've also got little robots that will circle you and they will be on the offensive or they'll be on the defensive or they'll help you speed up a little bit. And there's lots of little secrets and things like that to uncover and unlock in here. Fantastic soundtrack with this as well. And you're going to love all of the crazy early 90s bullet sound effects and stuff in here as well. And the screams of your enemies. It's a blast. I was shocked at how enjoyable this game was and how much it adheres to the classic Contra stuff. But also how, you know, Contra is often kind of borrowed from but it's rarely imitated to this caliber and this kind of effect. That's why when you play the classic games on an anniversary collection, they still stand up and it's like, wow, man, nobody makes games like this anymore. It's like they have the Contra methodology down over at Konami and even they have suffered over time. They've tried to kind of recraft Contra in 3D polygons and pseudo 3D stuff. And they've been enjoyable diversions, but there's something about the classic kind of pixel bullet hell vibe of that Contra core experience, and that's all in full effect here. Definitely check out Blazing Chrome, and if you've got Xbox Game Pass, you have no excuse, because it's sitting right there in your library. And I think this is out for everything, though. Blazing Chrome is worth hunting down no matter what system you've got it for. I'm gonna give it a nine out of 10.
Hey, look at that, my friend Hunter from Edmonton is here. He's wearing an incredible sweatshirt, my friend. I love that you're wearing the EPN sweatshirt. It's so cool. <laughs> it's surreal. Thank you for joining us. I, thank you for uh, having the show. I appreciate it. It's, <laughs> I've been watching for a while. It's uh, good entertainment. Oh man, saying. thank you. That's awesome. Thank you. We, we, we try, man. We try to get out and uh, talk to the people that make cool things and uh, talk about all kinds of very fun stuff out there. Yep. We're about to dive into Let's Play and Chat, and this is a game that just got updated, so I feel a little bit better about playing because there were some issues with this game at first, at least on my PS4 Pro. Uh, it's uh, Wolfenstein Youngblood, and Hunter, you've played this a little bit already. Yes, I yeah. have. Yeah. I've, almost to the end, but we couldn't finish the last boss. Oh, so wow, okay. We'll take we'll try it again. Take us in. We're at the we'll beginning see. here because we, we just we have basically started fresh. Uh, but take us in, show us your skills, uh, kill some Nazis, which is always fun. Uh, apologies to anybody that's a little squeamish. There's going to be some blood being sprayed everywhere in this game for a bit, but uh, it, uh, they're, they're Nazis, okay? And they deserve what they get. Um, uh, this is Let's Play and Chat, so if you've got a, a comment or a question about anything, go ahead and uh, flood the, uh, the chats and we'll get to them. If you guys can uh, do me a favor and go all caps, that would be very, very rad. But I've got a question for you. What are you doing in Vancouver? You're from Edmonton. Uh, yes. Uh, well, I came out with my uh, my mom because she's out has work, right? Yeah. But, I mean, I just took this as an opportunity to finally see the show live. Oh, I've been dope. waiting to do for a long time. So. Awesome. What What are your thoughts as a, as a, somebody sitting down and watching a live show? It's pretty impressive. It's a pretty impressive set you got going on here. It's. Uh, does it feel pretty cool? Yeah, it feels pretty cool. Yeah, it's a, it's a good vibe. This is uh, I always get that feeling when and, and I hear that from people when they come and they, they visit us here at 390 West Hastings in Vancouver. Uh, they have a good time, and that's what this is all about. Uh, let's see. Okay, we got an, a, a, from Akash saying, Akashio, kill it, Hunter, <laughs> in all caps, <laughs> following the rules. Uh, that truly is, a, Audrey and Leon says, that truly is an amazing Contra game. It visually looks visually looks awesome as well, talking about uh, uh, Blazing Chrome. Comment from Nintendo Boy 17 anybody else think that the new Wolfenstein games have more in common with 007 shooters than a classic Wolfenstein game? Not a bad thing, as I miss Bond shooters, but still, uh, yeah, I think that there's a, a little bit of an homage to uh, uh, GoldenEye and stuff like that. I mean, yeah. they all learn from each other. That's true. Yeah. I, I love how violent it is in our, in our space right now. <laughs> it's incredibly gory. Is this game making uh, game making your guest feel angry, upset? I need to reenact what's on screen. <laughs> D dub. Uh, yes, I guess this is a topical yes. question, right? Everybody's it's... thinking that shooter games make you really violent. Yeah. What do you think about all that? Uh, I honestly, it like it's ridiculous. Like most of those people, I guarantee, you never touch a video game in their life yep. and don't understand yep. uh, how. Fun it can be Dude, to enjoy that, a game no matter like really weird, how man. it's portrayed. It's entertainment, and we human beings have been telling uh, you know violent stories from the beginning of time. It's part of our makeup. Uh, there's a fascination with it, and uh, we have always wanted to sort of dive into the darkness. And it's not new, and it's not it just about the video game industry. Um, and uh, I think it's ridiculous to kind of tie entertainment to um, psychotic behavior like that. And it's lazy, and uh, especially coming from this, you know, a country that is so uh, lackadaisical when it comes to gun regulation, it seems so preposterous, you know? Sure. Yeah, all the stats are out there. And, th you know, honestly, I've been hearing this argument and this um, scapegoat kind of uh, analogy for longer than you've been alive. Yeah. You know? And it's just, it's so frustrating. And this time it's just so apparent and so obvious and gr gratefully, thankfully, uh, obvious to everybody that they're just trying anything to kind of push the attention away yeah. from what must be done, which is, uh, you know, take damn assault rifles out of people's hands. Like, the, the people should not be able to buy those and, uh, you know, go out and do heinous things like that. Uh, sorry for the politics, but I'm glad for Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez for calling out BS over video games and real-life violence. I, I mean, everybody that's got a brain in their head knows that this is ridiculous. Um, Pro Boy, uh, you can turn off your invisibility cloak. Oh, I, yeah, I, you got invisibility in this game too. It's yes. Uh, Jeff Meacham, thanks for saying my name in the rundown in last week's show. It made my me very happy you rock. 
My pleasure. Thanks for supporting the show. Thanks for being a part of, uh, uh, you know, the live experience and for uh, spreading the word. I appreciate it very much. Thank you for answering my question. I thought you might gloss over it, but I have more respect for you now because the topic is sad. These acts need to stop, but games aren't at fault. D-Dub, absolutely not. Uh, actually, my friend uh, Greg Miller wrote a, a nice piece in uh, Newsweek, which is being shared all over the internet right now. You guys should read that. Uh, it's it's so ridiculous that we even have to discuss it. When I saw that uh, Walmart has stopped putting displays about video games up, especially violent video games, uh, but they still sell guns in their stores, yeah, that is the that height too. of hypocrisy, you know? It's ridiculous. Uh, Greg Seward, uh, these violence conversations are giving me deja vu. What year is it? Yeah, Greg, you know this. Greg, uh, long-time uh, game journalist and been in the video game industry forever. Um, was probably, I think you were at EGM when a lot of this BS was uh, bubbling up the first time. Um, let's see what else we got in here. Thank you, uh, everybody, for joining us today. Rick Savage, uh, who said that... Uh, um, uh, the Expanse reminded him of Battlestar Galactica. Certainly there's some elements there. And some uh, crossover in the talent as well, which is cool. Actually, I've got two friends in uh, The Expanse. I didn't talk about this in the review. Um, uh, both actor friends. Uh, one of them I went to school with at the University of Victoria. We were in the theater department over there. And he was the, he was the James Dean star of UVic the year that I was at uh, in the theater department. His name is Peter Outerbridge. And he plays a total sc scumbag in the third season of uh, The Expanse, and I was like, wow, this is, what a great performance. Uh, but he was, he was like James Dean, and they did West Side Story the year that I was at, uh, at UVic, and, and he just looked like a total dude out of the 50s. He was amazing. Then I went to another school called the Film and Theater School here in Vancouver, and Matthew Bennett was like the James Dean of uh, FTS, and he was super cool and was uh, in all kinds of great stuff. And then both of them went on to have fantastic careers, but he shows up in the middle of the season three of The Expanse, and they're like both dudes that I was like, man, those guys are awesome. They're gonna have great careers, and they have had great careers. Matthew Bennett also had a long uh, role as a Cylon in Battlestar Galactica, so it was really cool to see friends in the show. And actually, I was texting with Elias Tefexis, uh last night because I, I'm totally name dropping right now, but he was in. Uh, um, he was in The Expanse in the first season as well, you know, doing some live action stuff. And he's terrific in the, in the show. Uh, and of course, he is the voice of Adam Jensen. And uh, he is doing an amazing job kind of flipping, you know, from the performance capture world into live action world, uh, doing voiceover stuff, doing commercials. And uh, he lives in Los Angeles now. Um, and uh, we had a good chat. He's very proud of The Expanse. And actually, his character, actually, I won't say anything. Just watch The Expanse. Uh, but he shows up again. I can't say anything. OK, anyways, watch The Expanse. He's, it's great. And uh, Elias to Texas rocks. Um, let's see what we got here. Uh, Jazz Deep Guilt, thank you. You're very sweet. <laughs> Uh, Wesley West, at least it's not, uh, oh, okay, we're, yeah, all right. we're, we're off of that topic now. Uh, question, Vic, have you ever been affected by the ESA leak or the weekend, or what are your thoughts on some people on the list talking to lawyers about suing the ESA? Uh, I, I, uh, yeah, there was a, there was a leak over the weekend, and, uh, my information was likely in there. I haven't really dived too deep into it, and I don't really want to talk about it too much, but, uh, um, uh, yeah, it sucks. It sucks. And it was poorly handled, and uh, I was not happy. Um, so, I don't know. Nothing to, nothing really to report on right now, but thank you for your concern. Uh, got a yes, Blazing Chrome from Sam I Am 111. Yeah, it's an amazing game. And Sam I Am 111, who knows everything about video games, said uh, it was made in Game Maker Studio, uh, which is, I I think it's like a $50 piece of software and you can make video games with it. Is that right? Oh, that sounds pretty good. Yeah, it's like uh, mostly for RPGs, I think, but you can buy it on Steam and then go ahead and make games. It's, it's nuts. Uh, but uh, lots of people do. Um, uh, okay, let's see. Anyone still playing Fortnite? I gave up because of the excessively large updates every three days. Hmm. Uh, let's see what else we got in here. I haven't played Fortnite in a while. 
Yeah. Conan the Barbarian, uh, don't wear pants. That's from Rick Savage talking about uh, the lack of pants in Danny's uh, character. Uh, all right. 50, 56 second boards. Let's see what we got here. Uh, Akashio says you have skills. Thanks. Yeah. I've been practicing. Is he crushing it? Killing. Yes? Very nice. <laughs> What's your weapon of choice? Um, well, I mean, in this game, I guess it changes because there's different shields. Yeah. Like, different guns, different shields. But shotgun, that's always the way it's to go. It's pretty effective, it's right? pretty effective. It's like a machine shotgun, too. Yes. You can just keep going, poof, 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 <laughs> which is the way you want to deal with Nazis. Uh, what uh, remaster remake should Activision focus on now that Spyro and Crash are on to original projects? Uh, that's Sam I am one one one. I uh, that's a good question because they have a lot of uh, intellectual property uh, that dates back. They sold Battlezone. That would have been my suggestion, um, and that was recently remade. It was pretty decent. Um, I wouldn't mind them going into their you know super old archive, their their '80s stuff, and bringing back a game like River Raid or something like that. Not Enduro. And we don't need racing games that go on forever. Uh, but there's lots to mine in some of these classic franchises or classic games that they. Um, River Raid, actually. I'm going to say that. You know, it was made by a female developer, uh, which uh, Jeff Keighley and the Game Awards honored a couple of years ago. I was so overjoyed to see that. I used to love that game on the old Atari 2600. 90% of you probably don't even know what the hell I'm talking about. Uh, but it was a great game, and uh, it was, a, you know, it was a, the idea of flying up a river and trying not to get shot down. It was a great shooter for a very primitive piece of video game technology. And it was intelligently made, and it sold well. They made a sequel, and uh, it would be fun to kind of uh, redo that again with new tech. I think that'd be a blast. Okay. Uh, it's a good question. Blair Farrell's got a question. Games have the... Uh, 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 EB Games have the Marvel and Star Wars Arcade 1-Up machines up for pre-order. Planning to get one? Uh, yes, I am. <laughs> uh, thank you for that bit of information. I might be visiting the website after the show today, actually. Uh, very excited about that. Hey, Vic, uh, uh, should we expect further classic EP episodes on the channel? I love heading down memory lane. Uh, Greg, absolutely. And we are also planning to do um, uh, some extended cuts and um, some throwbacks, like where are they now, kind of tied to new type of content. We're, we're, we're working on that stuff like crazy. Uh, honestly, when we're not cutting new things, that's what we're doing, is digitizing the classic content. And uh, Blake has been doing a lot of that recently, and a lot more of that's coming. We're just trying to figure out how we're getting it out to everybody. But uh, yes, we want to share everything. We want people to be able to watch uh, the 25 years of, uh, of the material that we've been putting out. One of the things that bugs me about YouTube is that it's so focused on the now and it's so focused on your immediate release of whatever video you, got, you, you put out there. And people do find the classic stuff and I see the comments and, and the views sort of pip up every once in a while. But yeah, we have so much classic material but YouTube isn't really focused on how to serve that up. And I I wish there was a way, a better way to kind of, uh, you know, let people know that we have all of this stuff. Even our first five seasons, if you've never watched the first five seasons, you should take that trip because uh, uh, we were allowed access to a world that was completely foreign to us and to most of the, uh, the viewing public out there. And it, those were extraordinary days. Um, but yeah, the, the, the goal is to serve it all up and to uh, entreat all of you to help us spread the word so that more and more people have access to all this stuff. Very little access and uh, uh, interview content is going up with developers these days. And definitely what it is about that I see with, the, with these developers is it's all tied to you know a purchase. It's all tied to the features that are in a thing. And, an EP does a little bit of that for sure, but what is more interesting to me and to the people that we've uh, worked with over the years is the impetus, the creativity that inspires these people to go and try to dream up and uh, find ways to entertain us. That is always incredibly inspiring, and that's that's honestly what we have to offer, uh, you know, across our many many years of doing this stuff. But good question, Greg. We are definitely going to get that stuff up there. 
Uh, you were trailblazing in those early seasons. Thank you, Greg. You rock, man. Uh, I've got time for like two more questions. Blair Farrell's playing uh, Turok 2. Uh, comment, thanks for answering my question. Sorry if it was too personal. You're awesome. Famous Seamus, thank you so much. Thanks for your support, man. It's always great to see you. Adrian Leon has got the last question of the day. Vic, have you... Uh, uh, heard Indiana Jones and the Emperor's Tomb is now Xbox One backwards compatible. You just made my weekend. That is awesome. I have that Xbox game sitting right there. Uh, I think I've done it. I did it as a buried treasure. Okay, I'll do it again. Uh, that, I can't wait to see that sort of up to 4K. That's a classic game. I know uh, one of the, the art director on that game, Bob Donatucci, is one of my best friends in the world. And he's an amazing guy. That game is incredible. He gave me a, uh, a poster from the dev team years ago, and it's framed. And I, I, uh, I just moved it the other day. So um, classic Indiana Jones experience. Can't wait to play that uh, all up on my Xbox One X. Guys, that's going to do it for our, uh, our show on this Friday. We are back on Monday with an extraordinary show. Our friend Mike Micah from uh, Digital e uh, Eclipse. Uh, is with us. Mike Micah is, um, he's a super developer with ties to lots and lots of classic games. He's worked on lots of, uh, um, uh, I guess, you know, up conversions and ports. Uh, they've worked on lots of big games as well that are, are brand new and original at that studio, but he's a massive collector. And I'm gonna be talking to him about the, uh, the, the retro scene um, and, you know, how classic games are still incredibly relevant and still important to us in this day. And also we're gonna catch up and find out about the new games that he and, and the studio are working on. So please come back on Monday. It's gonna be at 4.30 p.m. Uh, Pacific, 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard. You can come and join us live in the studio at 390 West Hastings here in Vancouver. I'm sad that you're gonna be back in Vancouver, but yes, please come back. I, or you're I gonna hope, be in Edmonton. I hope, yeah, I hope yeah. I will be able to come back sometime. Please come back, and I'll, I'll do my best to uh, take this show on the road someday and maybe end up in uh, Edmonton, which would be rad. Yes, I would. Yeah. Thanks for uh, joining us today, Hunter. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks for hunting. Thank you all for watching. <laughs> Have yourselves a fantastic weekend, and play forever.